Know Your Flow Girly, episode number 57. Today's episode of the Keep It 100 Girl Show is brought to you by Target.com. On top of all of these great offers this week, Target is now offering free shipping on all orders. And guess what? There's no minimum purchase necessary. So now it's time to stock up on all holiday gifts early, even splurge on something new for yourself. I do it all the time. But this week at Target.com, they're offering $10 off $40 on apparel, accessories using the promo code STYLE at checkout. Also, you can get 25% off bed, bath, decor, and dining, and even an extra 10% using the promo code FALL at checkout. If there's any game fanatics in the family, they're going to enjoy buy two, get one free on all video and board games. For easy access, find all the Target shopping links to the sales located in the show notes right on your phone. In fact, you could also head over to ninababel.com backslash podcast and you're going to look for the Target shopping link located under episode 57. La música de Harry Fry. to the Keep It 100 Girl podcast and you're listening to Know Your Flow Girly. That's episode 57. I'm your host, Nina Babel, and I help women and men celebrate embarrassment in their lives. Girl with no filters, no judgment, and censor free. I keep it real, I keep it true. I mean, that's the whole premise about keeping it 100. But this week's podcast is more of a girl friendly, keep it 100 flavor. I help women on really how to use your voice with confidence. Be action takers because, you know, most of you out there are too shy, nervy, or embarrassed to ask these questions. I share what we all, that's women and men, are thinking, but not saying out loud in an unapologetic way. Girly Nation, are you ready to keep a 100? My hand is raised. How about yours? It's time for the percolator. Keep it 100. It's time for the percolator. Keep it 100 on here. It's time for the percolator. We're keeping it 100. It's time for the percolator. Keep it 100. It's time for the percolator. Let's do a recap on last week's episodes where we discussed relationship space. Sometimes you have too little and sometimes you have too much where they take five inches and they go a mile. But all in all, relationship space is perfectly healthy as long as you're comfortable with yourself and being alone. Some people view it as a compromise, right? They feel like they're either giving up something or they feel like they're losing a part of themselves unwillingly. Both single and married women and men reveal their truths about their situations. Then I went into birthday mode. In my whole Keep It 100 moment, I celebrated my birthday. And I committed to trying three new things. And I'm proud to reveal that I did two of the three. I just ran out of time, really. I ran out of daylight (laughs) when I was in New York. But the whole point is this. I encourage everyone to treat yourself every year when it comes to your birthday. So listen up to episode number 55 and 56, respectively. The goal of today's episode is to get period smarter. Let's be clear. Nothing will cure period pain until you understand where it comes from. Cramps. Like, they told me that working out helps to alleviate the symptoms of cramps, but that that is a lie. That is a lie. Cramps are horrible, and I really wish people understood. Like, when you have severe cramps, it feels as if you are dying. Like, I start to cry. It's so bad. There's nothing worse than cramps. Probably pimples are a close second, but cramps, 
take the cake. They're horrible. So you just, do you struggle through it or are you just, I, are you on meds? I struggle. I pray. I pop like three Tylenol. Um, I cry. Yeah, it's just a horrible experience. I'm on my period right now. And yesterday I was about to die. I was really about to die. So <laughs> sometimes I might miss class. It's that, it's that bad. So today we're going to educate all you women and period sufferers out there with the period basics. And I'm not doing it alone. Put it this way. If this episode had existed many moons ago when you were a budding tween getting your cycle for the first time... Trust me, it would have fundamentally changed the course of your period life for the better. After all, I think for me, it wasn't for the last 10 years, my stuff started spiraling out of control. And I really just got period smarter, no lie, like three, four years ago. That's a lot of years (laughs) of not knowing period health, like all of it. So I'm not going at this alone. I got some help. I recruited Dr. Bryden, who is a naturopath internationally known for being ahead of the curve people with natural treatments for women's health. In her book, Period Repair Manual, which I highly, highly recommend, and for the purposes of my episode, she addresses common period problems, symptoms, and helps us understand our period health better. And we could explore other options than what the doctor is just going to write a script for. So you're going to want to listen to this episode if you have an MIA period, right? One that just shows up when it wants. If it's light, heavy, or a wild card period on a funky schedule, you're in the right place. You're also going to learn about some modern period essentials to make your period week a little less brutal and more natural. Um, I mean, for me, mine's really irregular, so I'm kind of waiting for it. You have to alter everything you wear to your period. Like, you can't wear a white dress. That's off limits completely. And you always have to worry about, like, bleeding through. Like, I think they don't tell you that you have to, I don't know, any at any second you can bleed through, and that's just so annoying. I think my biggest complaint is that it's it can be inconsistent. It shows up sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't show up, and it isn't necessarily a bad thing it's just how your body is it's unpredictable and you don't know what like now you're wearing white pants like it can show up when you're wearing white pants right my biggest complaint is cramping I cramp a whole whole lot so when that first actually came on it was real uncomfortable with me and my mom she really didn't really talk to me about those things so when it happened it came out of nowhere and I just got a pain that I just didn't understand <laughs> All right, so today you're not going to hear this information in sex ed class, right, or health class. And most of the time, you're not going to hear this from your doctor unless you go to your doctor with a specific complaint. They're not going to give you this information free willingly because remember, you only get like nine, 10 minutes of FaceTime with them. And in the end, you get this script to solve the problem. Today, we're going to empower you with easy access easy breezy one two three ways to improve your period naturally people so you're going to learn five things number one the strategy for your period health you're going to get some bloody good ideas for women of all ages and stages of their period health number two your period should be symptomless yeah you heard right naturopath dr bryden raises the bar of expectations in hopes that every listener will take away the necessary steps of reducing their own period pain. Number three, alternative options to period pain. Get a pen and pencil or get your mobile phone because you're going to be writing down some natural treatments. Number four, stuff you don't learn from mom or your health class. Number five, if it works for me, it's going to work for you. So you're going to hear Nina's girl-friendly tips and period tricks. I just like the sound of things. All right, ladies, first things first. What is estrogen? How many of you can answer this? Estrogen really needs to be kept in check. It is the super 
power hormone. So I asked Dr. Bryden, what do women need to understand about estrogen and what do they need to practice regularly? Trying to keep estrogen in check and yep. reduce our own estrogen and reduce the impact of um, estrogen-like environmental toxins. For those of you with a history of breast cancer in your family, pay close attention. If you have regular breast soreness or enlarged breasts at the onset of your period, let me tell you something, your estrogen level is high. And I want you to grab the free download that will give you a cheat sheet of steps outlined by Dr. Bright. So estrogen is a very powerful hormone. I'm a big fan of estrogen, actually. It does a lot of good things for the body, but it, it's quite stimulating as well. So that's why the phrase I use is it needs to be kept in check. You know, we just need to have put some boundaries around it. In my book, I talk about estrogen as being that super charismatic friend that you like to be around and have come to the party. But once in a while, you just need to kind of close the door and have some time without her. Right. So it, it's a powerful hormone. Um, it definitely it stimulates tissue, uterine tissue. It, that's one of the reasons it would potentially lead to a long-term risk for fibroids. Estrogen stimulates breast tissue, which is why often we'll get kind of breast swelling and it'd be a bit breast tenderness when estrogen is high, which is usually just right before ovulation. And then again, during the premenstrual time. Control and reduce estrogen excess. You need to understand how to promote the removal of estrogen and why you're doing it and the whole impact that it has on your period health. There's different ways to control and reduce estrogen excess. So it's not so much about reducing your the body's production of it, although we can do that to some degree, but it's more about the key thing, the key message is how to promote the healthy detoxification or removal of estrogen from the body. Okay. And that's mostly to do with having a healthy digestion and also a healthy liver. So the, some of your listeners might know about or already heard about, have heard about the importance of intestinal bacteria yeah. for health generally. Right. They, so the bacteria, our bacteria do a lot for us. And one of the things they do is help to remove and detoxify estrogen from the body. If you have a problem with digestion, detoxing is a critical function for female health. In the next clip, Dr. Bryden explains the importance of detoxing and how it's related to female health. If there's a problem with digestion, which might often happen, I'll see it quite often after antibiotic use or something like that. Even um, other medications and um, having a bad diet can cause a problem with the digestive like the intestinal bacteria and that can impair the the removal of estrogen and that can lead to estrogen excess let's keep it real if you're not shitting <laughs> and yes i said it or going to the bathroom once twice maybe even three times a day you're gonna have a buildup of estrogen so having a regular bowel movement Going to the toilet every day is very, it's, it's important. So that's one of the things that I routinely have to ask my patients about is trying to understand what's happening with their digestion. If there's um, other symptoms like a lot of digestive bloating that can suggest there's a problem with the intestinal bacteria and that is going to translate into problems with hormones and problems with periods every time. All right, so we've obviously discussed digestion issues and how it has an impact on your hormones and period health. What to do? Dr. Bryden gives your opinion on what can help with managing your gut trouble and intestinal bacteria. And she talks about the avoidance of antibiotics as a starting point. I think one of the best things for keeping healthy intestinal bacteria is to as much as possible, avoid or you know not require antibiotics. I know sometimes they're unavoidable, but if someone, for example, if someone, a woman says that she has a recurring chest infection or recurring sinus infections or recurring bladder infection, whatever it is, that means that she it means antibiotics every year or a few times a year, then I say to her, okay, our strategy for your period health your PMS or your breast pain or even potentially fibroid prevention, our strategy is to fit, like sort out your immune system, like figure out why, treat the sinuses, treat the chest so you don't keep getting these infections, so you don't need antibiotics. That would be, it's thinking a little bit 
more broadly yeah. about a strategy for periods. And so avoiding antibiotics as much as possible and also can help intestinal bacteria and also healthy diet. So having more, the thing that bacteria love the most are vegetables. Girly Nation, your easy breezy step is the intake of veggies. The more vegetables, the better. Doesn't mean you have to be a vegetarian either. The good bacteria like to eat vegetables. So vegetables are very beneficial to promote the right balance of good bacteria Got in it. the digestion. I don't think we women ever make the connection with alcohol to our periods. I know I never did. So if you're like me, this next tip relates to another way to remove estrogen from the body. It has to do with alcohol. It's not the kind of equality that women want, but according to Dr. Bryden, we as a population really have upped our drinking habits recently. We tend to condone it because, you know, we have all these social settings, right? Like college parties, happy hours, and now we're in the holiday season. Listen to how alcohol really affects our periods. Who knew? The other thing that's really important to help with removing estrogen from the body is to have a healthy liver and that really does mean reducing alcohol so i see that alcohol you know alcohol too much alcohol can be can mean can again can translate into period problems and i like to i just mention it because the stats are that women are we're drinking more and more <laughs> and you know as a population there was just something in the news that women are now drinking as much as men is like that's not the kind of equality we wow. have no um, and it, it really does affect periods so as a general rule I, I would say you know as women we we probably don't want to be having any more than about four or five drinks in a week that's a lot for me I oh, that's even less I mean some people, I, I think and again I think less is better I think it's fine to have no alcohol it's probably the healthiest situation. So if you're one of those women who drink at least four to five glasses per week, you want to try cutting back on the alcohol because it only could have positive net new effects on your period. There's a link between alcohol and estrogen that Dr. Bryden is going to explain. We, we tend to sort of condone it and we say, oh, that's just how young people are. But I'm trying to push back a bit against that a little bit. And I think I think even young, I mean, even a 20 year old woman, I think can take in the information that this is, especially if she's having period problems. I mean, it's, it's, it's empowering for her potentially to know that, that just, you know, cutting back on alcohol could make her a tangible, a real difference. Yeah, the link between alcohol and estrogen, every time we have alcohol, it spikes up our estrogen quite a lot for a few hours. And that's probably why there's one of the reasons that um, alcohol consumption has been linked quite strongly with breast cancer risk, for example. Okay. Because, of course, that's one of the other long-term outcomes of having too much estrogen is an increased risk for breast cancer. Well, my biggest period complaint would be cramps. And what do you do for them? I take Motrin or Milo or vitamins. I take vitamins because you know when you take the when you take the pills, which is the the Tylenol or Motrin and stuff like that, makes you go to sleep. It would be breaking out. I do not feel cute when I break out. I just get so upset. <laughs> um, I guess the way that I handle my breakouts is just like I feel like if I work out, it just it releases all the toxins, wash my face, and then look cute afterwards, and then fine, it will go away. It happens before and during, I guess. I just got to control it. I've just been lazy about it, which is sad. So the lower back is always an issue for me. Um, cramps always are bad, but I take medicine for that. Um, and then just getting really emotional. Like I always think of my ex-boyfriend like right around that time. It's definitely back pain, lower back pain, cramps. And just like the fact of like having to take medicine for it, like it's just such a pain. And then being too bitchy, I had it for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you're a naturalista at heart, let's talk about natural period remedies for common female health experiences that women of all ages and stages of their lives can relate to. There are effective natural treatments for all those things. 
and they're all a bit different so we, we really have to kind of speak through talk through a few of them one by one but let's start with post pill acne which is quite a common experience and one of the reasons it happens and it can happen to women who never even really had a problem with their skin before was that the same was that you yeah oh my god i could i didn't understand what was going on because i had cystic like really bad and then coupled with that and what you said earlier about not being regular i was yeah. regular in my late 20s oh so your periods weren't weren't coming regularly no they oh. my periods were regular oh. to the bathroom oh all right what happens with the skin is that well depending on the type of hormonal birth control some of them um, some of them have the kind of side effect or side benefit of, of suppressing skin oils and suppressing male hormones quite strongly so that means the skin depending on how many years you're on birth control the skin gets used to that situation it's used to not having very many male hormones it's used to having its skin oil like its oil dried up so then when when a woman stops the birth control there's a rebound effect and the skin kind of can go a bit crazy it usually starts a few months after stopping it it's like suddenly it's like oh, okay there's all this potentially male hormone the skin oils have really sort of ramped up because in response to being used to being suppressed for all those years and so it can post pill acne usually starts a few months off the pill it usually is at its worst about six months off the pill and or off birth control and that can that's about the time I find a lot of women just give up it's like this is you know crazy I must need my skin must need the pill they think and so they go back on what to do Dr. Bryden discusses acne causing foods along with other natural skin medicine treatments so the treatment for that, what I do, if someone's already had that experience where it was very difficult to come off the pill, I try to start treatment, natural treatment, before, even before they come off so that the skin is as happy as possible. And that, um, for skin, that usually re means removing, um, to start with removing acne-causing foods, which are sugar, like any kind of concentrated sugar, so desserts, sodas, um, you know, cakes and sweet coffees and like all the mocha coffees, not like, uh, which are kind of like milkshakes really. Dr. Bryden gives an A to Z explanation of PMS and our declining hormones every month during our cycle. And she also tells us about those happy brain chemicals. So PMS, I want to say that PMS is not caused by our female hormones. I know that's sort of seems counterintuitive because obviously it does correlate with hormones. With it, 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 it basically happens when both estrogen and progesterone are falling, reducing at the end of the cycle. And that it's normal for a woman to, for hormones to go up and down. So when the body's healthy, it can adapt to that reduction in hormones relatively easily but when um, PMS happens is what, what the research is showing is when there is some chronic inflammation in the body so inflammation is when the immune system is a little bit chronically activated by say having bad food in the diet or a problem with going back to the intestinal bacteria a problem with bacteria um, stress other things can cause this chronic inflammation and that inflammation makes it harder for the body to adapt to the declining hormones so that's that's the way I think about PMS that seems to be what you know what works for it so um, one of the simplest treatments is a combination of two supplements um, magnesium and vitamin b6 they often come together in a tablet and that um, reduces inflammation in the body and it also boosts some of the good what are called neurotransmitters or some of the happy brain chemicals gets a nice boost from that too so that can help to buffer the hormone withdrawal 
The good news is this. Unlike most medicine, there's a wait period for it to take effect, right? But not with these natural supplements that Dr. Bryden recommends. And it works quite quickly. So a magnesium and vitamin B6, a problem often if a woman starts that, she'll notice less PMS in the very first cycle that she takes it. And other ways to reduce chronic inflammation and therefore reduce PMS is to, again, is to remove inflammatory foods from the diet, which comes back to sugar. So I'm, I'm, I'm really against sugar. Yeah. <laughs> removing sugar and potentially removing, for some women, removing dairy products can help. Our periods are our monthly report card and so is PMS. This is our body trying to tell us something. Most women you. Most women use PMS as a crux, an excuse to give in to their sugar cravings, which Dr. Bryden has pointed out. Sugar is an inflammatory causing food. It's not just having, it's not just what you're eating during the PMS itself, but during the entire cycle, the entire month. So it, we're kind of, uh, uh, the phrase I use in my book is that our periods are our monthly report card of our health generally. And PMS is the same. It's kind of like a report card of where we're at. So if we've had a month where we've been eating a lot of inflammatory foods or had a lot of stress, for example, or a problem with the digestion, or all of those things mean it's more likely to experience PMS later that month. So it's about eating healthy all the time. And then, um, you know, getting the payoff, getting the reward of having less PMS. Both Dr. Bryden and I talk about that whole appetite surge that messes with our minds the week before a cycle. But more importantly, Dr. Bryden says there's a snowball effect to this type of behavior. It is, it's normal for appetite to go up during the premenstrual time. So that's, I advise my patients not to fight that, not to worry too much. It's normal to feel a bit hungrier. That's just a hormonal effect. That's okay. I think as women, we have to give ourselves permission to eat more when we're hungry. So maybe have, but what that, a better strategy for that is just to have a second serving of dinner or just have, just to eat more, but not as if possible, you know, not reaching, not, not reach into the need to reach for, to not give, not give into the need to reach for sugary foods and junk food, because that's just going to make it worse. Yes. That cycle and probably make it worse the next cycle. As well. The menstrual cycle is a long term project. It's not a quick fix. Any changes that you make after this episode will take a couple of cycles to see the benefits and even the results. My approach is that the, the menstrual cycle, and which all depends on how well we've ovulated that month, as I said, it's kind of a, a longer term project. I think it's often our monthly report card, our period, our PMS time will be the result of probably a couple of months of healthy eating. And so I see, I see it in a longer time frame than that. I don't, I don't advise my patients to eat to micromanage their period on a week by week cycle. I just don't really see that it works that way. But Know your flow conversations. Probably. Hmm. Don't tell me you have a good. Well, I mean, I cramp, but it's not that bad. Like, I know people cramp, like, bad. Like, in the bed, like, I can't move. I can't go anywhere. Like, I would literally wait to the last minute to take medicine. Like, I just walk around like, oh, all right. But I don't know. I would probably say the, um, just the idea of, I know that I'm on my period. I feel like everybody around me knows I'm on my period, even though they don't. So maybe it's just like the anxiety of it all. Yeah, I would say personally for me, the length, because I come from a family, I guess all the women in my family like last seven days, eight days. So it's like I don't have time for that sometimes. But, you know, I just got to live with it. Maybe after I have kids, things will change up, you know. The MIA Girly Nation. Hey. One minute it's here, one minute it's not. Dr. Ryden talks about how this population of women can regulate their cycle. So the first step really is to try to get a diagnosis, a proper diagnosis. So the period, as I said, the period doesn't have to come, it doesn't have to be spot on 28 days. We're not looking for that kind of perfection. 
but it should be coming between every 21 to 35 days. Because if it's not, then that probably means that the woman is, that she's not ovulating regularly, that her ovaries are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And therefore, it's not just about not having a period. She's, she's not getting the hormones that, she's need, that she needs. You know, it's, it's, there's other effects from that. Um, it's, it's, it is important, I think, to have for the cycle to be regular because we get the benefits of the hormones and also because it's a sign. Remember, the period is our monthly report card. So having a regular cycle is a sign that everything is okay. Um, in fact, there a, was a new the gynecologist association just, just last year, early this year, I think, in 2016, released a paper, a recommendation that doctors should help their patients to track their cycles knowing that what they called it is that the period, a regular period is a, what they call a vital sign, as in it's a marker of good health. And there's a lot you can, if the period's not coming regularly, that's straight away a kind of a warning sign that something's not right. And it can be lots of different things. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. This is where the doctor and the woman have to kind of put on the detective hat and just start thinking about what is going on here. What's going on here? Dr. Bryden says it's polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is PCOS, and gives us direction on what we should really be asking our doctors. The most common explanation for a period that's coming every, say, three months is a condition called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is very common, which affects one in 10 women, probably more, possibly more like one in five. It's, um, wow. yeah, it's, and it's growing in incidence. And I, I think it's for a few reasons. I think it's to do with partly our diet because it's very much affected by um, having too much sugar in the diet can be a big risk factor for it. And it's affected by exposure to environmental toxins like we talked about before. So the way to diagnose PCOS is blood testing. So the doctor needs to measure, hopefully measure a hormone called insulin, which has a, um, that's our, our blood sugar hormone that affects, this, it, for many women is an underlying cause of PCOS. And also be checked for male hormones or also called androgens. Very often women who, if they have PCOS, if that's the reason for their irregular periods, they may also have um, male hormone symptoms like some facial hair or increased body hair or hair, head hair loss or um, chronic acne. Girl Talk, Dr. Bryden addresses acne, male hormones, especially if you're experiencing PCOS. Like acne is not, it doesn't always mean PCOS, but often PCOS sufferers do have it. And it's normal to have some male hormones. So for your listeners, just confirm that. It's actually, we need a little bit of testosterone and that's normal for us, but there's a sweet spot. So if it goes too high, then that that's usually part of the picture of PCOS. Facial hair. How much hair is too much hair? That it's not that embarrassing. I think having the odd, like a little bit of hair on the upper lip or the odd hair on the chin doesn't necessarily mean PCOS, okay. no. True PCOS, they, they actually get, it's more than the stray hair. Like they start to get okay. quite a lot of hair. Mm-hmm. Quite a, well, quite a lot of hair, they wax it. Usually women will wax it and so you, people won't see it. But it's, um, it's, you know, and women can move into, you can have at some time in your life, if maybe, maybe say if someone's been eating quite badly or they can have PCOS that's worse, h- higher, male hormone and then things improve again so it's not it's also i I want to say it's not like if you have pcos you always have pcos um so in your case you might have moved it's hard you know hard to say like you might have moved into a little bit if if your and if your testosterone was high on blood tests that does mean something that means the ovaries basically they start making more testosterone compared to estrogen and that's it's it can cause symptoms and also just it's, it's a sign that the ovaries are not entirely happy so yeah I, I prefer I think it's better to have testosterone in the norm in the normal range but how would someone draw the conclusion or ask their doctor if they have PCOS or not like 
just based off the physical symptoms. I don't know if that would be enough for me to even. The act. main, yeah, the main symptom is a regular. It's a regular periods. I think that's. And you said your periods are regular. So in your case, yeah, in your case, it wouldn't be top of my list, top of my concern. Okay. But for someone who is ble having a period only say three times a year, Ooh. and or something, you know, and has facial hair and has. Um, you know, it can, it can affect, PCOS can affect metabolism as well and ability to lose weight. So there's kind of a whole picture there. And if that's happening for someone, yeah, I think it's very important to measure testosterone on blood tests and measure insulin and look, and also look to see if ovulation is occurring. So usually with PCOS, there is no reg, even with these, you know, bleeding every two to three months, probably that ovulation has not occurred, which means... We talked earlier about how ovulation, is the main event of the ovaries, it's how they make a hormone called progesterone, which is a very beneficial hormone. So if they're not, one of the big problems with PCOS sufferers, is they're not making progesterone. So they're not getting the benefits of that. So potentially, you know, that's affecting long-term risk for things like um, fibroids and um, other sort of uterine disorders. And it's, 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 it's yeah, it's, it's good to fix it. The good news is this. It's very much treatable and reversible. But bear in mind, there is a whole genetic tendency that will always exist, and you can't get rid of that. It very much is treatable. It's largely re reversible for a lot of women, although they, they probably will always have a genetic susceptibility or a tendency to that, but with treatment is hormones can all come into the normal range the conventional treatment for pcos is to give a diabetic a diabetes drug called metformin which helps to reduce insulin and therefore treat the underlying cause and the natural equivalent to that is a combination of removing sugar from the diet completely and exercise which is very helpful and then some supplements like magnesium some of my favorite supplements can help normalize insulin, normalize PCOS. Um, there's a couple of other supplements that I talk about in my book. Or um, I talk about PCOS in some detail in Chapter 7 of my book. Raising the bar of expectations. Out of all the supplements, magnesium should be your default. And myself and Dr. Bryden are going to tell you why. This is what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about raising the bar of expectations. So that's what it can be like, is you just, you're, you're having a you know, regular cycle, your body's working, you're ovulating, the period comes, it's not, not too problematic in any way. Magnesium can also help with the headaches, kind of premenstrual headaches that you mentioned. But, well, you were talking about pill headaches, but you know, some women get hormonal headaches as well, and magnesium can really help with that. All right, the next topic for Girly Nation are those with light periods. Listen up and uh, you're going to find out that it's actually normal. Well, that's normal. So there's a, big, there's a big range of normal. for So a normal period is anywhere between probably two days of bleeding to seven days of bleeding. It just depends on how much estrogen an individual woman makes. Um, the, it can range between normal flow can be between, well, I think in terms of milliliters. So anywhere between sort of 20 milliliters over all the days of the bleeding, which is not very much. It's like a couple of tablespoons of blood, yeah. um, like a few, you know, partly filled tampons over all the day, over the two days of bleeding is okay. And on the other end, um, it shouldn't be more than about 80 milliliters of menstrual fluid, which is equal to about 16 tampons over all the days, say over all the four or five days. So that gives, yeah, just a little kind of range of what's normal. Any heavy bleeders in the house? Listen up to these natural remedy tips. This goes back to the beginning of our conversation, you know, when we're talking about ways to reduce estrogen in the body by having reducing alcohol, having a healthy intestinal bacteria. Also, there are some supplements that can really help to lighten flow. Um, turmeric is the one that I use the most. So I'd like a turmeric tablet every day through the month can just quite dramatically reduce the amount of bleeding. It's important to make sure that a woman is getting enough iron, because obviously she'll be losing a lot of iron, bleeding like that, and also being 
having iron deficiency can make bleeding heavier. So it, it can be quite important to, to, to think about iron, maybe ask the doctor to check iron, maybe take it and take a gentle iron supplement because some iron is quite harsh on digestion and so women don't want to take it. But there are other kinds that are much gentler, much easier yeah. to take. And just another tip. So <laughs> cow, back, back to dairy, you can tell I kind of, <laughs> I talk about dairy a lot. Yeah. I think I think dairy can be a problem for a lot of women, not for everyone, but another situation where dairy does seem to make periods quite a bit heavier. So if someone's struggling with heavy periods, I might suggest that she avoid dairy products for a few months together with, you know, the turmeric and that can really make a difference. And just another trick is that um, like an Advil or an ibuprofen taken during the period reduces the flow by about 50%. So what? yeah, it's just an easy trick. And I, I prefer, obviously I don't want my patients to have to take a medication like that every month. Right. And it's only during the one or two days of heavy bleeding. But even perhaps while they're waiting for the natural treatments to work over a few months, they could, that's something, a little trick they can do to, to lighten their flow because it's definitely better than be flowing that heavily and becoming iron deficient and all the problems that go with that. Endometriosis is slightly different to the other period conditions we've talked about during this episode. In case you're part of Girly Nation that falls into this category... This is the bigly of them all. Yeah, again, it's pretty high. It's about 10% of women have potentially have endometriosis. It's a separate, in a, in a way, it's maybe it's, it doesn't really fit with a lot of the other things that we've been talking about. Endometriosis is, it's not just a hormonal condition, but it, it potentially is actually quite a serious inflammatory disease of the pelvis that causes painful periods and other symptoms. It um, it requires the, the treatment I natural treatment that I use for that is more about reducing inflammation and trying to correct you know correct the, that process. So the the warning sign this comes back to raising the bar of expectation, right? So the, the big sign of endometriosis is really painful periods, like the kind of pain that a woman can't sit up straight like you know she's a double over curled up on the bathroom floor you know painkiller taking painkillers but they still don't really help not able to go to work you know vomiting that's the kind of pain that endometriosis can cause and it's that is not acceptable so there's i think it, there's a an awareness raising happening right now around endometriosis, just trying to bring it, because it's been such a silent, hidden condition that women just, the doctors just tell them, oh, that's just part of having periods, that's just period pain, like, what are you complaining about? But that's, none of that's normal. Mm. So there's a film called Endo What? Endo Dash What? That talks about, I know what, I've talked to some of my patients who have endometriosis, they said when they watched that film, they, a lot of them cried, because it was just about, it's such a relief to hear other women talking about their experiences and realizing that it it's not normal and you know there should be help for it it's um yeah so you if your listeners have that kind of pain that i was just talking about they should look look further maybe watch the film and think about speak to the doctor about whether it could be endometriosis all right girly nation are you an mia bleeder heavy bleeder pms or do you have post pill acne then you need to look for the cheat sheet Get a list of Dr. Bryden's natural supplements paired with the period condition or symptom. Visit bit.ly forward slash Dr. Bryden. B-R-I-D as in dog, E as in elephant, N as in Nina. Dr. Bryden. So now we're all period smarter, right? But it's just the beginning. We haven't talked about ovulation, hormone birth control, perimenopause and menopause yet. So in part two of this series, Dr. Bryden is going to address them all. And we're going to use the same format, right? Like what's the problem? What's the remedy? So it's only fitting to summarize what you learned today into a bigger picture of really what happens to your hormones from day one to 30 of your menstrual cycle. 
This syncs all the information that you learned today, and you're gonna be able to pinpoint your condition, your symptom, the natural treatment, or your period health, whether it's a 21, 28, or 30 day cycle. Again, if you use the recommended natural treatments and you use them consistently, then the reward is ahead of you. It's gonna pay off. You just gotta give yourself that 60 day window and beyond to see the benefits and the results. Okay, so we're, our hormones are very low. They're at their lowest point during our period. Um, and, then vo- and then estrogen starts to climb around probably day so day when we speak in days it's all counting from day one is the first day of the period that's how women should be counting it putting in their period app day one is the first day of proper bleeding proper flow any spotting that came before that is part of the previous cycle so day one of the cycle is first time you see the real flow then by about in a 30-day cycle by about days six or seven estrogen is start starting to climb quite a lot which can feel quite good breasts might swell up a little bit and you start to see the fertile mucus, the egg white mucus that we talked about. But the, usually there might be some almost a euphoria around that time. There'd be a more confidence, higher libido. That's all leading up to, well, the higher libido is a little bit unfortunate because that's often, that's when you're most fertile as well. So that's, you know, in terms of, if you're trying to avoid pregnancy, then you, <laughs> your body wants to be pregnant at that time. So your libido goes up. Um, and then ovulation about day 14 in a 30-day cycle, the release of the egg, but also the body you're making for the first time progesterone, which has a nice calming effect, is the kind of like the yin to estrogen's yang, it counteracts estrogen a little bit. Progesterone can make you feel a bit sleepier, sleepy, increases appetite, which is why it's normal to have a bit of a stronger appetite in the second half of the cycle. And then both hormones, estrogen and progesterone, stay quite high until about a week before the period when they start to drop and that's the premenstrual that's your but your nervous system starts to feel both hormones dropping and you can ease that by a lot of the things i talked about the magnesium avoiding inflammatory foods can just make that transition a lot easier yeah it can start to feel a bit irritable and as hormones drop and then um and then yeah they come back come back to the point where they're both hormones are both low again don't we get a second surge of libido like right before your period? Yeah, I think some women can from, I think from that sometimes that drop in progesterone can just sort of some of your underlying, so we also, the other hormones we have all the time are just our male hormones that are there all, normally, they're all the time, kind of just more in a steady state. And depending on how, how high estrogen and progesterone are compared to that, we can, yeah, some, some women, I think libido can vary quite a lot, but yeah, some women can report a libido increase my top nina girl friendly period essentials is number one maca look i take it in powder form it improves my mood people i am in a good mood on a consistent basis the libido is up and the hormone situation is always imbalanced especially now that i'm in that whole perio menopausal phase of my life number two b6 and magnesium i mean if you're going to choose anything start with this It is a must, a must, a must. I don't even know when my period is coming. That's how great it is. Evening primrose, if you experience cramps, this works immediately. Like, no brainer immediately. Look, this one, no one tells you this, but refrain from cold drinks, refrain from ice, the week before your period, because that will contribute to the cramps. And five, I use period tracker religiously. So if you're one of those people who is just unsure of where you are in your cycle, what days you're most fertile, what days you're actually ovulating, this is a good self-checker, especially if you want to avoid any kind of pregnancy. up another episode of the Keep It 100 Girl Show. I'm your go-to girlfriend here to empower you every week, ladies. The best conversations happen after each podcast. I bring socially and sexually awkward taboos out in the light that most of us only share with our girlfriends. I talk to my listeners like I talk to my own girlfriends with advice about failures, successes, embarrassing choices, and aha moments that really put us all in check. 
We women tell the truth, nothing but the truth, even if it's totally embarrassing or super cray cray. Just want to give a shout out to Dr. Laura Bryden for offering her wisdom, her tips, and breaking down period health to women like we understand it. You can check out her book called The Period Manual on Amazon. You can download it as a Kindle or you can order it as a paperback. Secondly, I want you all to check out her healthy hormone blog at www.larabryden.com. That's www.larabryden.com. If you want to share your story, drop me a line, question, or pitch your own Even if it's something really, really small, don't hesitate. Reply to this podcast or send me a quick email at ask at ninababel.com and tell me what you're struggling with. And if you have a solution, even better. New episodes of the Keep It 100 Girls show drop every Tuesday on iTunes, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. You could also connect with me on social. My handle is at Nina Babel on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and you could check out the Facebook Keep It 100 Girl page. But that's all for keeping it 100 this week. I keep it 100. I keep it real. I keep it true. Smooches. <laughs>